Welcome to this week's TDD Weekly Report for the week ending March 1st. I've been talking on a lot of the TDD reports about the Chinese space mission, the Jade Rabbit, which went into hibernation for the second time now and not really sure if the thing is even functional anymore as far as moving around and being an actual lunar rover, which it was meant to be, but um, I want to actually get away from that and get onto the uh, United States NASA space program that is coming into the home stretch. That's the New Horizon mission to Pluto. I don't know if many of you recall, but back in January 2006 is where it launched, and we're reaching a real milestone now. It's coming up on the uh, period where it's going to cross the orbit of Neptune. That's going to happen in August of 2014, and then the countdown is going to be less than a year. As of July 2015, it's going to actually reach its closest encounter with Pluto itself. So if you get a chance, I'm going to actually put up some uh, some of the slides here and some of the pictures of where it's at right now. You can go to the NASA website and you can actually, they update it every hour on the hour and you can see exactly where the craft is right now in relation. It's uh, I think just under four astronomical units, that's the distance between the Earth and the Sun from Pluto right now, traveling at about 31,000 miles per hour. When it encounters Pluto, because of the way the craft is designed, it's going to do it as a flyby. It's not going to be able to, because of Pluto and the size, there's not going to be any chance that it's going to be able to actually stop or be captured in orbit or anything. It just, uh, at the speed it's traveling and with the size of Pluto, and not to forget Charon to the, the moon attached to Pluto, um, it's just not going to be happening, but there will still be plenty of time to get really good pictures, really good data. Um, they're also thinking about the fact that if the mission is extended past the time, that it encounters Pluto, it may actually, when it enters the Kyber Belt, if there's finances and they decide to extend the mission, that it will actually maybe uh, encounter one or two Kyber Belt objects, maybe around 90 kilometers in diameter or so. So even after it's done with Pluto, there's a little bit more left. So you can't really totally count out NASA as far as uh, space things. To me, at least, uh, that means a lot, too. Uh, in case you didn't know, in the state of Illinois, Pluto is still legally, by law, a planet. It's not just a dwarf planet like the uh, Astronomical Union made it. So that's because of the fact that a guy named Clyde Tombaugh, he was the one that discovered Pluto originally. Um, he was a native of Illinois, actually born in Illinois. Next up, this is from um, the Chrome browser. If any of you are um, using the Chrome browser, I'm using it more and more as a backup browser. I still use Firefox because of the extensions and everything like that. This is something that's going to concern me. Now, um, the title says, Chrome rubs beta users the wrong way with update new versions shutting down users' apps. Um, that's not really super accurate. What it's doing is the uh, new beta version that's being tested, it's shutting down extensions. If you don't have a, an extension that's from the uh, App Store that's uh, officially, uh, you know, kind of uh, given the go-ahead by Google, if it's a third-party developer or something like that, they're just not allowing it to run. Now, I can see that for beta testing, that makes a heck of a lot of sense. Um, right now, my version of Google Chrome, I think it's up to date, and it's version 33. But they're claiming the plans are when they get to stable release version 35, which is two versions from now, they're actually not going to let regular users um, use third-party extensions. I have a problem with that. They say it's for security, and I can understand that too. But I would like the option, as um, especially for more advanced users that know what they're doing, I would like the option of being able to shut that off and use third-party extensions by my own choice. If they totally shut it out and don't let a computer user choose for themselves to use third-party extensions if that's what they want, to me that's going to kill it as far as Google Chrome being anything but ever a, a backup browser for me. I don't want a, uh, a browser to be telling me what extensions I can and can't use. Um, I think that's just ridiculous for advanced users. So if you get a chance, um, give me your opinion down in the comments below about what you think about that. And uh, next up, this is from my buddy Harry T. There's um, an engine out that's uh, being developed by some guys in New England. It's called Duke Engines. And uh, these guys in New, e in, uh, New Zealand, they've developed a, an axial radial engine, or some people call it a barrel engine. Um, it seems like it's a new idea if you look at it, but I actually explored it a little bit and found out this um, the actual idea of this type of barrel radial engine goes all the way back to around, I think, 1906. They had the first practical models, and they had a lot of, uh, by 1910, they had a lot of models actually functioning, um, showing that this engine could be built. But it's interesting in a way because the um, size and the weight of it compared to conventional engines is um, 
really quite quite a bit better. I mean, the the advance, you know, with the advancements of uh, the design, they could fit this thing into torpedoes and stuff like that. They could fit it into aircraft because they could fit five cylinders. Usually, the most practical design version of it has about five cylinders, although it can have any number of cylinders, just depending on how you want to design it. But it can fit in a small area. And what they're trying to develop with the Duke radial engine, I'll show you some um, pictures and some animation here. This um, one of the links I have has some pretty cool animation because one of the ways this engine is designed, um, these pistons basically are surrounding the barrel going up and down so they're all parallel to each other in a circle. But some of the versions of the engine, the engine and the pistons and everything itself actually moves around and turns whereas the central shaft stays still. And uh, that's kind of neat too. But one of the things about the design of it too that's kind of that they're trying, the Stuke engine is trying to uh, overcome is the fact you can't operate it at really high RPMs like you do a conventional car engine. And I notice in their website, too, at the Duke Engines website, they're talking about that that's what they're really working on, too. And I also notice in the future, they don't have one of the possibilities as a car engine. They talk about using it in aircraft. They talk about in military applications, industrial uses. But um, I don't really see to where they're pushing, although it might be cool if they could get this. Supposedly, the, the five-cylinder version of this engine can produce the equivalent horsepower of a six-cylinder engine. And you have like a 20% weight savings, so... If they can get some of the um, design things overcome to be able to get it to operate great, I think this could make a, a really, really cool thing in the future. And I love this because they have um, plenty of animations here to kind of explain to you the different versions of it. There's uh, the basic uh, axial radial engine itself is pretty simple to understand, but when you look at all the different uh, versions that people can design, and as a matter of fact, a motorcycle company even had a little bit to do with this. There was a, a Spanish flyer, and I'll try to get his name right here, Heraclio Alfaro, so I'll just call him Alfaro. From, he uh, got a medal from the King of Spain because he was one of the first aviators. I think he was the first aviator for uh, the country of Spain. Well, he actually was a teacher at MIT and developed his own version of a, uh, one of these axial radial engines. And um, it didn't actually, um, he wasn't actually able to get it into an airplane like he'd planned to do, but later on, one of his students named Stephen DuPont. Um, actually developed it for the, I think it's called the, yeah, the Doman helicopter. He actually de developed a version of this engine for the Doman helicopter. And not only was Stephen DuPont a uh, student of Alfaro, he actually was the son of the president of Indian Motorcycle Company and developed this in, then developed the uh, newer version, the updated version of this engine in 1938. So I think that's a really cool uh, connection between a motorcycle company and this radial engine. And, uh, Last up, before I finish, I would like to um, ask a favor of you guys, the viewers of the TDD Report. If any of you have seen, I haven't seen it yet, the movie Gravity with Sandra Bullock and uh, George Clooney. It's been out for quite a while. I don't know if it's even in movie theaters anymore. I haven't had a chance to see it, but I think in the next week or two, I'm going to see if I can find it on Netflix or somewhere like that and take a look at it. But I would like you guys to help me out. I, I saw one article about quite a few different... Um, problems with uh, the movie as far as related to science and how some of the things in the movie are inaccurate as relates to science. Um, so I would like you guys, if any of you guys are kind of geeky and picky about stuff like that, if you've seen the movie Gravity with Sandra Bullock and George Clooney, let me know if anything has stood out in your mind as far as when you watch the movie as far as science errors or um, errors with physics or anything like that in the movie. It's hard for Hollywood actually to put out any kind of a length of a movie, I think, without some kind of... Uh, at least errors. I mean, when you're talking about science fiction movies, they, a lot of them don't even explain the fact that somehow these uh, spaceships have artificial gravity in, in, inside and they don't even give any explanation for it. So, yeah, if you have get a chance to do that, and uh, I'll uh, talk about that as soon as I, if I see it in the next week, I'll talk about it. If I see it this week, I will talk about it next week's show. If I see it in the next couple of weeks, then I'll talk about it right after that. And uh, I will include some of the stuff from you guys in the comments of anything you've caught as far as science errors and stuff like that in uh, this particular Hollywood movie. So that's it for this week. Take care, everybody. I will catch you next week.